You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme... The cost of conservation. Gabon's environment minister calls for more money to help protect forests essential for absorbing carbon emissions. The number of environmental defenders killed trying to protect ecosystems reaches a record high. And are small solutions the more reusable packaging enough to make a big difference to the climate crisis? That's one of the topics up for discussion in today's climate show debate. Hello there and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and challenge those who are coming up with the solutions. First, to Gabon, known as Africa's green superpower. It's one of the most forested countries on Earth, but its environment minister has told Sky News it'll be very, very difficult to continue to protect the country's rainforest if it's not properly rewarded for careful conservation efforts. Now, nearly 90% of Gabon is covered by forest, which captures more carbon than the country emits. Some forests there store more CO2 than similar forests in the Amazon. On average, each person in Gabon contributes about 2.2 tonnes of CO2 emissions each year, while in the UK, the average is more than double that at five and a half tonnes. Well, since 1990, Gabon's emissions have stayed roughly steady, about 4.7 million tonnes in 2019. But if we look at the UK's emissions, they were far, far bigger at 370 million tonnes. But when you factor in the carbon dioxide absorbed by Gabon's forests, nearly 100 million tonnes every year, the country actually becomes a net carbon sink with negative emissions. And because of the reduction in its CO2 emissions, Gabon became the first African country to receive a payment of £12 million from the Central African Forest Initiative. Gabon is the fifth largest oil producer in Africa, but as this source becomes more scarce, timber has become a valuable asset to the country and the government has agreed to keep deforestation at low rates, but says this comes at a cost. Our climate correspondent Hannah Thomas-Peter reports now on the choice facing the country between profitable commercial deforestation and preserving the country's trees. We're in Gabon on the west coast of Central Africa at the invitation of its government. They are flying us deep into the jungle. The aim to help us understand more about one of the most forested nations on the planet. From above the canopy, you get a real sense of the sheer scale of this forest, stretching for hundreds of miles in every direction and covering nearly 90% of Gabon. It's part of the Congo Basin Rainforest, which is such an important ecosystem. It's known as the lungs of Africa. Gabon has been able to afford to leave this jungle alone because it's an oil-rich nation. But prices are plummeting, production dwindling, and so that's about to change. You have to read the trees. This is the Akumi tree. Which is the Lee White is the country's British-born environment minister. 60% of our economy is going to disappear in the next 20 years as, as oil revenues disappear. We have to replace um, the, those revenues with something else. That something else is the forest. Gabon wants the international community to pay it for careful conservation or risk deforestation for logging and agriculture. I think it would be very difficult to maintain forests long term without a real partnership between developed and developing countries and without a business model, an economic model that makes rainforests valuable for the people that, that live in them. Firstly, we are looking for a forest elephant. Here we have two species of elephants. We have a savanna and a forest elephant. Degrading the forest would put one of the most biodiverse regions on the planet at risk. In Lope National Park, we see just some of the wildlife that lives here. A family of chimps crossing the savanna. And later, forest elephants. More than 50,000 of them live in Gabon. 60% of the world's population. But even here, climate change is having an impact. 
warmer temperatures reducing fruit growth on trees, pushing the elephants into villages. That is uh, the big problem in Gabon. Every day there are in the plantation to eat the plants, like cassava, everything which uh, the, the, the woman plant. That night, evidence on our doorstep of the problem, a group of 12 foraging near our lodge. As climate change intensifies, so does the fragility and importance of this ecosystem. Gabon is one of the few countries on Earth that absorbs more carbon than it emits. It's why this whole region is crucial to the battle against climate change and why what happens here will matter far beyond national borders. This is the strength of Gabon's negotiating position at the COP26 UN climate summit later this year. Tongi Gahuma Bakali is the man making the argument for a new carbon market that rewards conservation. Because of the need to become emergent countries, all tropical countries in the world lose their forest. It's a fact. Our forests still uh, stand. The trees are still stand. So now, help us to, to, to not become like other tropical countries. Gabon is at a crossroads, trying to make an environmental asset profitable without destroying it, a model for the future, but only if the rest of the world agrees. Hannah Thomas-Peter, Sky News in Gabon. Well, you can read more about Hannah's reporting from Gabon on our website. You just head to skynews.com forward slash climate. Now, in today's other climate news, at least 30 people have been arrested after climate protesters blocked several junctions on the M25. Motorists faced long delays while the activists sat on the roads during rush hour, obstructing turnoffs, in, including Heathrow Airport and Swanley in Kent. Campaigners from environmental group Insulate Britain say that they want government action on home insulation. And the Royal Horticultural Society has launched a new campaign to encourage gardeners to become more environmentally friendly. A recent survey from YouGov found that less than a fifth of gardeners are using more sustainable methods in their gardens. The charity has come up with a list of 10 climate-friendly actions that people can take, including using rainwater to water their plants and making their own compost. Tesco is introducing a reusable packaging system across 10 of its stores in England in a bid to tackle plastic waste. Customers will be able to buy everyday products in packaging that can be returned to the store to be cleaned, refilled and reused. And we'll be discussing if small solutions can make a big difference or if they don't go far enough. That's in our daily climate show debate. And today I'm joined by the science broadcaster and WWF trustee Zaya Tong and the Director of Union of Justice, Majid Majid. That's coming up for you in just a few moments' time. Now, Nicola Sturgeon says that the Scottish Government will fund COP26 Youth Conference, which will take place ahead of the main UN summit in Glasgow in November. Usually the government hosting the meeting, this year the UK, would also fund the Conference of Youth. Well, speaking to her party's conference, the First Minister described the wildfires, extreme heat and storms that have ranged around the world this year as a wake-up. In a few weeks' time, world leaders will gather here in Glasgow for the UN Climate Change Conference, COP26. Make no mistake, this summit represents the world's best chance, probably our last chance, to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees in line with the Paris Agreement. Nobody underestimates the scale of that challenge, but no one should underestimate the impact on lives, particularly the lives of the world's poorest, if we fail to meet that challenge. Now, a record number of activists working to protect the environment and land rights were murdered last year. The campaign group Global Witness found that 227 people were killed in 2020 alone while trying to protect forests, rivers and other ecosystems that their livelihoods depend on. Here's more about the environmental defenders on the front line of climate change. Environmental defenders are uh, any individuals who engage in peaceful activism in order to ensure that our rights to the environment, such as our right to air, right to water, right to land, uh, is fully realized by any individual. 
we think the 2020 was the deadliest year on record uh, because the stakes are really that high insofar as environmental conflicts around the world are concerned. For instance, in the Philippines, we experienced a doubling of killings of environmental defenders under the current Duterte government. And this coincides with a marked increase of uh, commercially operating large-scale mines. This coincides with steadily decreasing forest cover. So the Philippines ranked in this latest iteration of the report as the third deadliest country in the world. Uh, the first would be Colombia and the, that would be followed by Mexico. I think the, the, the crucial turning point would be to, to really have a strong policy basis for asserting our rights. Uh, and so a, a legislation to, to really support environmental defenders would be the, the crucial uh, pivot to, to, towards the, the, the increased safety and towards the increased effectivity of the work of environmental defenders. Well, do stay with us because coming up after the break, I'll be joined by the science broadcaster and WWF trustee Zaya Tong and author and activist Majid. Majid, good to see you both. They're going to be discussing if developing countries should be paid to protect the environment and whether small changes can actually make a big difference. out of that little room. Mandatory evacuation, you must leave! I'm Greg Milam, Sky's US correspondent here in Los Angeles. It is almost impossible to predict where these fires will go next. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. Give you an idea of the strength of those winds, strong enough to bend and twist metal. Are you trying to run me over, Sir Philip? No, go away. Look like it, sir. Will you respond to those who made accusations, Sir Philip? Can you go away? I've seen the dark side of America. We are standing on the supply line, right into the heart of America's opioid crisis. I've seen heartbreaking human stories. There was a river of blood coming out of the mosque. That's a scene that you don't forget. Christchurch has been changed forever by what happened here. I'm Tom Cheshire, and I'm Sky's Asia correspondent, based here in Beijing. It's estimated that around 70% of our coastlines are experiencing increased erosion. We start with a steel structure that we put into the seafloor. We then pass a, a very small electrical current between what we call an anode and the, and the cathode, and the structure itself is the cathode.
Did you know that driving us to school creates extra toxic air at drop-off and pick-up times? It will be a rather cloudy start to Tuesday with outbreaks of rain in the south. Heavy and possibly thundery rain over southern England, the Midlands and parts of Wales will slowly move northwards and it will feel muggy. Scotland and Northern Ireland and the Republic will brighten up with just a few showers. Taking a look at the daily air quality index where levels of air pollution are bandied from 1 being low to 10 being very high, low levels of air pollution are expected to continue on Tuesday and for much of the week ahead. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. Hello and welcome back to the Daily Climate Show on Sky News. We're getting straight to discussing the climate issues of the day and challenging the solutions to them. That is with the science broadcaster and WWF trustee Zaya Tong and Director of Union of Justice, former MEP and Mayor of Sheffield, Majid Majid. They're very good to see you both tonight. I want to start after uh, the Gabon report that we were playing there. I just want to gauge your view on the philosophy, really. Is it the response? responsibility of richer nations to be helping developing nations with their climate change goals. Majid, what do you think? 100% yes, and I'll explain. It, it's, it's firstly important to recognise that the climate crisis is hugely unjust. Like throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, countries like the UK and those in the global north were and still are some of the biggest the world's biggest emitters of carbon pollution and as a direct result have become some of the world's wealthiest nations. And let's be frank, that's, it's, it's largely happened at the expense of developing countries such as Gabon in the global south. And as a result of issues like colonial and post-colonial and relations, so countries like the UK and other kind of more advanced countries and in Europe have got a moral obligation to compensate those countries and communities that are negatively impacted by climate change due to our, let's be honest, our collective failure to tackle reasonable steps to limit our emissions in the past as well and as today. Because so it's going to take a global approach to it rather than just individual approaches. So a big yes from you, Majid. What about you, Zaya? Well, I have to agree with Majid there. I know that rich countries are disproportionately responsible for climate emissions and that poor countries are disproportionately impacted by climate change. And so obviously there's a debt to be paid from rich countries to poor countries, but there's a way of going about that. There's good models and bad models. Uh, Morocco and what's happening with the Green Climate Fund is an example of a good model. Perhaps we can talk about that. But one thing that I want to point out, if you consider something like losing weight as an analogy for lowering emissions, right now what the rich countries are saying is, hey, we want to eat all the ice cream and we want the poor countries to do all the diet and exercise. It's all going to balance out on the books. But the question is, you have to say, A, is this fair? B, even if those poorer countries get fit, they can't continue on that treadmill if the emissions continue to rise. Fundamentally, what needs to happen is that the rich countries have to lower their emissions and their resource use if you want to see that real change. They have to stop eating that proverbial ice cream. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that. And I just, I just want to bring in this quote here because this really speaks uh, to the issue, doesn't it? Uh, here we go. And it, Really, when you've got the, the richer nations um, enjoying the economic growth um, that has come as a consequence of, of damaging the planet, and then they're expecting developing countries to do their bit. I mean, we're, we're talking about a lift there for African nations. What does that lift look like? Majid, what do you think? Well, we, we need to unlock funds and resources to developing countries that are affected by um, years and legacies of extraction and exploitation. And I think a really good first step and an essential one towards repairing um, this, as well as historic injustices and saving our planet, is for countries in the global north who are, and I'll keep repeating it, responsible for this crisis, is to immediately engage in a wide ranging program of debt cancellation towards developing countries. So as to at least break one link in that long history of extractive exploitation, and the COP26 really gives us a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, and Zai, what do you think? I imagine proposing their debt cancellation, does that work? 
Well, I think that there's ways that you can work with local countries so that you're not imposing your ideas on another sovereign nation uh, and making them develop like the old 1980s development models. What I like about what Morocco and the Green, uh, the Green Climate Fund, what they're doing right now, if I could share with you for an instance, in Morocco, they have argan trees. And these argan trees have been harvested for millennia. They produce the nuts that make the oil for my hair, but it's also a great food source. The forests there are a buffer for desertification uh, for the Sahara Desert. So right now, those forests are suffering from over-harvesting and climate change. But what the fund is doing is they are building tens of thousands of hectares of argon uh, of orchards. And so what that's going to do is that's going to be an extra buffer for desertification. It protects the natural forests. And also, it's going to be a, a sequestering device, 500,000 tons of additional carbon being sequestered by the trees. But best of all, it helps the local economies and the women in particular who have cooperatives who've been doing this traditional way of life with harvesting the nuts and producing oil. As an end effect, I get some argan oil for my shampoo. But fundamentally, what we have to do when we do this sort of transfer of wealth is we have to consult with local countries and we have to do things that are to their benefit first. Yeah, it needs to be a consultation, doesn't it? Well, let's uh, move on now to look at that new scheme that's being launched to try and make it easier for shoppers to recycle and reuse packaging, which we heard about earlier. It's designed to help encourage people to purchase items in packaging that they then return to the store so it can be cleaned, refilled and reused. But are small solutions enough to make a big difference or do they, in fact, distract from the large-scale measures that are needed? And when you look here, you can really get a sense of the scale of the problem there. I mean, I want to get both of your views um, on that. Do you, and packaging is an immense problem, isn't it? You can see that there in the, in the quantity of it. Um, do you think we think enough about it or does it get lost in the debate about what we eat, Majid? It, it, it does get lost at times and it's, it's a great start, but um, it's not enough, shall I say. Obviously, reusable packages, changing your diet and other behaviours like that is a step in the right direction because I do believe that when people actually kind of unite in their activism, which those small changes are, large, large scale changes can actually happen. However, that being said, like we, we must kind of really stay vigilant and continue to put pressure on companies and other elected and our elected representatives to kind of create that fair, sustainable, just world that we desperately need to save the planet because if we're only going to be focused on small and, and individual acts, we'll kind of lose sight of the main culprits on this. It's not individual people like my uncle Abdul or Stacey from Greg's that's responsible for two thirds of all global emissions. It's 90 companies, which our government subsidizes. So as well as doing our small bit and repackaging everything, we kind of need to kind of also make sure that we put in our and attention, kind of holding those people into account. Yeah, well, nobody's blaming Abdul and uh, and Stacey, I should say. Well, what, do, what do you think, Zion? Do you think um, th this is just tinkering around the edges? It's only 10 stores, it's only some products. Does it miss the bigger issues like uh, haulage and, and food production? I think the thing is that what we're seeing is that this debate is always framed as an either or when it should be both, but it should be weighted. So as an example, uh, recently, the Extinction Rebellion scientists actually leaked a draft report of the upcoming IPCC uh, report. It's a draft, of course, but what it suggested is that if 10 to 30 percent of our citizenry actually did the good work of reducing our emissions, eating less meat, fewer air cons, less flights, what we'd actually be able to do by 2030 is actually reduce emissions to the equivalent of two Brazils and change social norms. So this is actually quite fundamental to change. But keep in mind, that's 10 to 30 percent. The other 70 to 90 percent, what needs to happen there is enlightened policymaking, regulation. You need to have corporate impact. That is the heavy lifting that has to be done. The one thing I like about the Tesco Loop project, we have it here in Canada too, we have it at Loblaws, is it's actually just an, a twist on an old idea. It's the milkman model. You're paying for the milk, you're not paying for the bottle. Okay. So if the company is incentivized to keep making better packaging that lasts a long time that we can reuse again and again, then that does start to make a difference. All right, really lively discussion with you both. Zaya Tong, Majid, Majid, thank you very much for your time on Sky News.
Well, that's everything from us for today. Joining me on the show tomorrow to discuss all of the big climate issues will be Fatima Ibrahim, co-founder of Green New Deal UK, and Bob Ward from the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment. But do stay tuned for now, coming up on Sky News tonight. Children aged 12 to 15 years old to be offered a COVID jab in the next phase of the vaccine rollout. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you at the very same time here tomorrow on Sky News.